Hi and welcome to Schmooze with Suze. This is going to be a somber interview. I know we kind of yuck it up from time to time, but this one is near and dear to my heart because it lives within my home. I'm interviewing two men tonight that were in the Vietnam War and they're part of the Ventura County Veterans. Vietnam Veterans of Ventura County. There you go. Howard got it right. This is painful uh, in a lot of ways because we're going back in time and a lot of us lost people in our lives at that time during Vietnam. Either family members, neighbors, brothers, it was painful. We're going to revisit this because I think it's time to take some of the scab off the wound and start really healing more again. And I think this organization does a lot to make that happen. And that's why I invited Howard Tenshin today and John Hankins, who's pinch hitting for uh, Ron Fitzgerald, who couldn't make it today. Thanks for showing up, John. You're welcome. I'll feed you at home. So today we're just going to talk about a lot of things that are, like I said, painful. And I think there's a piece here that I wanted to read briefly that John my husband, who is a professional journalist, wrote, and you wrote, what year did you write this? 1965. 85. 85. But it says this was dated 1965, so that's when you were there, correct? Yes. The News and Review of Santa Barbara, which is now the Santa Barbara Independent, they asked a whole bunch of different people, what did you do in, during the war, Santa Barbara? And which would accrue to uh, Ventura also. Uh, and so they asked me, as well as other people who might be um, mothers with kids at home and their husbands at the war, and uh, all different kinds of people were that, that were affected by it. And so they asked me about my experiences there, and so I wrote this piece. Briefly, it says, I checked into the Hong Kong Hilton, switched into civvies, and picked up the Time magazine. That's why I first learned of the details of what the Canberra, which was the ship you were on, had been doing off the coast of Vietnam. That's when a few of us started to feel something was wrong with the war. When we, though we cou uh, couched it in cynical, tough guy talk about officers not knowing the brass from their ass. Good phrase. Coming home, I found another war going on in America. One image sticks in my mind, the National Guardsman in full riot gear, calmly eating breakfast at a family pancake house in Berkeley, then guarding the People's Park with guns. Protesters stuck flowers down their barrels, yet later were beaten by their own police when trying to regain control of the park. I was arrested in People's Park. The only time I've been arrested, I dodged the rest of them but I was arrested in People's Park and spent the night in jail to my mother's chagrin, who never let me forget about how her daughter was a jailbird. I don't regret that. I, own, I regret the fact that I had to do that to get my vo voice be heard. And a lot of my contemporaries felt the same way about the Vietnam War. We all used the kind of a lame-ass excuse, which was it was not a war that was the Congress voted on. It was a military action such Korea was. Well, we've now, thankfully, in the United States, woken up to the fact when we finally recognized that Vietnam vets were due to get paid, paid back for serving there with benefits. And that's going to be part of this discussion as well. 
So Howard, you enlisted, you drafted, what happened? I went to college for two years, Fresno City College. And I came down with an illness. I had to drop a phys ed class. And I knew by dropping that one class, they would reclassify me from a student deferment to 1A, which that was the draft, and I was going to be drafted. They did that kind of Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. A young man out of high school, that's what was our options. You had a book or you had a gun. That was our options. And because in many cases you couldn't even get a job because the employers would know they would train you, the draft would take you, and there goes their new trainee. So we had to, you know, make a choice. I chose to join the Air Force for four years. John, how'd you get in the service? I, uh, in high school, I was not real interested in going immediately to college. I have a very curious bent of mind. I wanted to see the world, so I joined the Navy. Uh, and so I was still in high school uh, when I, I was training uh, once a week. There was a program there. You're, you could join when you were 17 and your parents signed you. And then in the summers between my junior and senior year, uh, I actually went off in a ship, uh, which was really interesting because I was in an oiler, which uh, is a refueling vessel out uh, on the Atlantic coast when our submarine, the Nautilus, went down thousands of feet and got crushed. And so we were refueling the boats uh, and the ships, I mean, uh, that were searching for it. And then I went back to my senior year. And then um, after I got a senior year, uh, I graduated and immediately was inducted into active service in New York and applied to seas uh, uh, to the Mediterranean, the Azores, Africa, had a wonderful time. Sounds like a vacation. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> um, we eventually uh, got, uh, maybe a year or so into it, we got uh, recommissioned to the West Coast. Each ship has a port home port. We went through the Panama Canal, which was dangerous at the time, we got recommissioned on the West Coast and then uh, had a nice vacation in um, uh, San Francisco, Hawaii, and the Philippines, <laughs> and Japan. And we're in the middle of the Pacific. The ship was the USS Canberra, which is named after the capital of Australia, and was an honor to honor Aus the Australian people who, who are right with the United States, have been for years. We didn't even get to Australia. The captain gets on the squawk box and says, uh, uh, even though we had a personal invitation from the Queen of Australia, they said, oh, we're going, we're going to go to a different destination. Uh, it's called Vietnam. And we're going, what is that? You know, this is 65, which was the turning point in the war. So in hindsight, that's why the ship was recommissioned to the West Coast. They wanted to beef up the flotillas and the exactly. war machine. But they didn't tell you? No, uh, and oh. so, uh, and so uh, no, I wasn't an officer or an intelligence, so I didn't need to know that. You are told what you need to know to do the job. And so we ended up in Vietnam, uh, off of Chu Lai, off of Da Nang. Uh, we were doing um, a junk patrol in which... Uh, What's a junk patrol? A junk patrol, junks were what, what, what the Vietnamese use as their transport uh, these small uh, boats that carry chickens, grain, that's the way they transport things oh, okay. up and down the course and up the rivers and everything. Well, of course, the Viet Cong were likely uh, smuggling arms and contraband and ammo uh, in junk. So we, we, we were the uh, ship that was the center of that operation and in using intelligence and actually going out in basically what would be a PT boat, stopping the junks and, um, and inspecting to see what they had there. What did you do with the Air Force? I was a radio intercept analyst. I gathered intel. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. that, that, that was highly specialized, Very wasn't specialized, it? yeah. I had a top secret crypto clearance. And you couldn't talk about this to no. anybody? No. Did you, have you ever since? Not details, other than the fact that I was a radio intercept analyst. So 
So that's all you can say. Yeah. That's all we <laughs> all need All the to information know. I had at that time was secret, top secret. Uh, it's all probably been declassified by now. Uh, Tell me a little bit about your organization, because I see you guys at parades. Yes. This is how you and I connected, at parades, events, anything the VA does, like open the new place in Oxnard, yes. when I met a whole cadre of you guys. You yes. were all out there. And you're doing this as a volunteer, right? Absolutely. Why do you reach out to Vietnam vets as a volunteer? Well, we actually reach out to all vets. Uh, this organization was formed almost 35 years ago, because at the time, uh, veterans weren't getting their benefits. You know, they'd say one thing and do another. And this organization was founded by eight Vietnam veterans who uh, wanted to do something to help their fellow vets. And uh, as it transpired and evolved through the years, we, we welcome all veterans, because they're all brothers and our sisters. We all served, we all did our part. I'm, and, I'm uh, we, wholly impressed. We tried, if, in fact, I joined this group five years ago, and it was because in 2010, they brought the Vietnam Memorial Wall to Ivy Lawn. Every time it's come, I've tried to visit that wall. I have friends on that wall. And these guys uh, kind of took me in. I was still standing back. And uh, in fact, after I joined the, the group, uh, they literally took me in their vehicles and drove me down to Sepulveda to receive my benefits and get enrolled in the VA. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be getting the benefits I have today, which have greatly improved, as I understand. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, when we were talking, that uh, after 48 years after leaving Vietnam, big di diagnosed with PTSD, carrying burdens. When I worked Intel, when I left, they said, you know too much, keep your mouth shut. I did. And that's when I got into in college, I just focused. And it turned out to be a good thing for me. I'm, I li I'm in horror of anybody that served in wartime. Oh, first of all, uh, I've got, like I shared with you, mm -hmm. I've got a lot of vets that are my students, but they're mostly World War II guys. I get an occasional Vietnam vet. Mm -hmm. And there's distinct differences in the two populations. Oh, absolutely. And when my husband, John, started experiencing some medical issues, and I'm like, something's going on here, John. And he goes, well, now nah, I'm going to my MD. I'll go b uh, back to my primary care doc. He's good enough. And I go, uh-uh, something else is happening. I rode his ass. And I dragged him in to see the local VA's office. He, was, he, he really didn't want to do it because he didn't think, like you, there's other guys out there that are probably worse off than me. Absolutely. And they need more help than I do. Absolutely. I don't really want to take it away from them. Okay, and as you said, the VA benefits were really crappy and they have been in the past. So when we walked into, the, and it was a year ago, July, that I dragged John in there, just a little over a year ago, and we talked to a nice man, and he says, well, John, I'm not sure you're eligible for anything, but we'll fill out your paperwork. Well, time went on, and John, we didn't hear anything, and then in December, I think it's when you finally heard that you were accepted into the program, right? The VA program for medical care, correct? Is that right? Yes. I didn't really know how extensive the services are that the VA has now. Now, you, when, when you signed up for VA benefits, was it all like that? I had not? a hearing problem. And my, my fellow vets, like I said, drove me down there. And I had a few hearing tests. Oh, guess what? about 30% deficient tinnitus in my left ear, and I've got some degradation going into my right ear. And guess what? I now have hearing aids, which I forgot. But, oh, typical. But, yeah. yeah, this is But uh, Yeah, and, then, and that's when it started. Okay, well, how, how about this? Well, I was having burning as I am right now. I got some neuropathy going on. Well, that's a situation with Agent Orange. As every veteran, 2.7 million of us that actually are in country, Wait a minute, back yes. up on that one. Yeah. How many? 2.7 million served in country during the time of the conflict. Yep. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. I never realized the numbers were that high. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Agent Orange. Well, you had a draft. You, it, it, they took what they needed. Yeah. How many people have been affected by Agent Orange? Do it we is have a, any idea? If you, are in, if you serve in country, you are pursu pres presumed to have been exposed to Agent Orange. 
And it also uh, extends into the Blue Water Sailors. That's recently it has, uh, yes, 88 miles out. recently. Yes. And that was my case. Yep. Uh, they did diagnose it. Mm -hmm. uh, one or two of my ills. Long overdue. Uh, was uh, done by Agent Orange. And I want to say one thing about this, and that is uh, it, it's the science that figured it out and made the medical connections and everything. And one of the things that uh, uh, bothers me is that I was in the stores division and we were handling supplies, uh, which included Agent Orange. They did not have a warning label per se on it and all that. I, I can get more information about uh, uh, that weed killer Roundup uh, on its label than we ever got in handling mm -hmm. these ex her this extreme herbicide. Besides which, we're going up and down the coast, and the uh, and the planes are dropping Agent Orange uh, uh, along the trees to to kill the trees and the brush, so that they could actually see the enemy, which of course went underground. <laughs> you were trying to yeah, but they had the the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Yeah, and they what had they, the had, they had to defoliate the canopy to yeah. expose it to see be exactly. able to see the ground movement. Exactly, yeah. and yeah. then put our bombs where they needed to go. Yeah. You know, when John was diagnosed, I did my own research, and I've shared it with him, and I'll share it with you, that the Agent Orange material that they sprayed, when they were done with the war, they dumped it. The federal government mm -hmm. dumped it and they dumped it into the Vietnam Sea and the Philippine Sea of all places, which as my brain is a science brain, I've got one of those weird wired brains, and I'm thinking to myself, so if they dump it in the sea, that means people bathe in it, drink it maybe, I mean, they have access to it. Like what on your happens? Navy ships, you would, re you would process your water, your drinking Absolutely. water yeah. from the ocean. It was drinking right. water. Absolutely. Well, you yeah. process on the ships. Holy crap. But also we yep. were close to the, uh, we, we were uh, close to the coast. Exactly. All, yep. all that time I was there. Exactly right. It so wasn't as if we were five miles out or anything like that. We were right there. And then of course, when we were in our, doing our junk patrol, I mean, you could swim to the shore. Yeah. Well, just and a recent article in the, uh, I think it was the Wall Street Journal that I read about three months ago. And it was about this. I mean, because yeah. mm -hmm. Like it or not, we have more information today than we've ever had before. Of course. Not always positive stuff and not always stuff that you want to read. I mean, because I read every news source you can imagine. The right, the left, the in-between. I want to be fully educated about, since I'm a teacher, what I'm talking about. And, and I get a lot of information. Like mm -hmm. today, you gave me new information I can take back to my class. And when you come and visit my class, you can tell us stories. And John, and you as well. But I'm thinking to myself that these stories need to be told now to future generations because Agent Orange, if you drank it, if you bathed in it, this article in the Wall Street Journal three months ago says it will get into your DNA. Correct. Well, it's also- How many generations uh, is this going to affect how It's also when you don't breathe know. it because, yes. uh, I mean, you're talking about uh, hundreds of square miles of herbicides. Uh, yeah, but it's in it, your DNA. And it's carried in the wind and all that. Don't you worry about our kids? Don't you? you that's know, part, I've already that's had part a of kid. it. I that's all part of it. it. Yes. Holy crap! It's about time the feds get off their asses and does something well, for you guys. Well, right now there well, is a uh, Agent Orange yeah. Registry with the yeah. VA. Okay. What is and that? You, that is a where you, if you serve in Vietnam, you can register, and that way they can track you mm -hmm. and. So they're your, keeping your, detailed records. Yes. Yes. They want to see how far it goes. That's one of the forms that I thing. have that I'm filling out. Now, think yes. that, that's positively thinking ahead. Yeah, yeah. Because they I'm, need a database, and that's now, what it's for. being a kid that was always, you know, like I said, I was a protester. He was mm -hmm. over there, and so were you, you know, mm -hmm. giving your life and your time to your country. I was over here protesting it because it's not a real war, okay? I was one of those kids. I'm not always proud of that now, but I mean, at that time, yeah, it was something I felt compelled to do. Mm -hmm. Do I trust the federal government now? I don't think I've trusted him since Nixon. I think that's when I lost my innocence with Nixon lying to me. I mean, maybe it happened before, but now well, I am patriotic, yes. I'm very patriotic because my family were immigrant, you know, Italian immigrants. And so I was very, I was raised to be better, this is my grandmother, 
You're better than the Americans. You, she, and this is the way she used to talk to us as kids. Sounds like understand. my grandmother. She also was Italian. And you, raised, you were raised that way. With a so, lot of pasta. A lot of pasta, <laughs> a lot of food, but a lot of great times. Absolutely. But Absolutely. We, we were raised differently than most, and I think we have an appreciation as children from immigrant families to what we have today, mm -hmm. or maybe what we should have today. And I look, you know, since I watch all the news sources, like I'm rapidly involved because I'm involved in law and legislature. I read all this stuff and I, I get everything I can. I think I'm trying to fill in my missing pieces of when I was younger and didn't, wasn't fully engaged in the process. Like I didn't keep up with Vietnam vets. I mean, I was grateful they served, but I didn't really know what, you know, they were going through. Maybe because I was so horrified by what you both had to see and go through and live through. And now it's even worse because now you're, 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 it's affected your whole lives. We made the best out of it. I mean, these are the cards we got dealt and you, you moved on. You went, we talked off camera a little bit about Walter Cronkite. Yes. When I, when I was sent over to Vietnam, I had a four year commitment. I spent three years in the United States and my last 53 weeks of service, they sent me over there. My first week there, on the 19th of December, we took rocket fire at Thompson Air Base. And Walter Cronkite reported that the base had been destroyed, essentially. And my wife was watching it on TV. Oh my God. I immediately got on the Mars Network, which is a military affiliated radio service. What they did, they put you in contact by ham radio to your loved ones back in the state. Oh. Working the intelligence part, I knew they would be gleaning information off me. And I told my wife, everything's fine. They didn't hit a damn thing. Interesting. And that was, and she's watching, essentially, I, we talked earlier, they were watching the war on TV. Well, we did. Yeah, it was absolutely. in our living every rooms night. Every, every night. night. Exactly right. The body count by Walter was right at dinner time, too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, probably. Yeah, I mean, every night That's we... That's how you gain audience with the sensationalism. Well, has the media changed? Not really. Mm -mm. So I think to a large degree, we, uh, the media really, I feel it's their duty to educate, but to tell the truth. A uh, journalist story is only as good as its sources. As a journalist, you could say that. And uh, one of the reasons why the Vietnam was so heavily protested is because the government was lying to the people of the United States. I'll give you a few examples. The body count, it's well known now that all the body counts that showed us that we were winning were lies. They were inflated and all that. The other thing is crap like, oh, we're not invading Cambodia's airspace and we're over there rolling our eyes and say, well, we know we're invading Cambodia's airspace. And, and some of it may be to hide uh, what your plans and things are from the enemy and public relations okay. things and that they're there. But I mean, we never learn because if you look at the history of the Iraq war, that was also built on lies. False info. False info. So, and it's a lot of the stuff, Howard, you know, that is now coming out that was top secret. And the government knew from our intelligence agencies that Iran was, uh, or Saddam Hussein, uh, was not uh, 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 churning out nuclear weapons anymore. Howard, do you trust the federal government? I, I trust so. me. Do you trust the federal yeah. government, John? Absolutely not. I, I think trust, you both answered the same way. Wait a minute. I trust the intelligence officers, what, what is it, 20, 20, we have 27 to 29 intelligence operations mm -hmm. uh, groups thereof. They might be Navy, they might be Army, they might be overall. All of them have come to the actual conclusion that Russia interfered in our elections. And they don't care if there's a Republican or a Democrat in office. So it's when that kind of information becomes politicized. Think of our history. LBJ had done amazing things socially, and yet he was forced to not seek re-election. 
because of all his lies in Vietnam. He really blew it. That was his Achilles heel. You look at Nixon. Why was he forced to resign? Because they were, they, they were pulling the wool over America's eyes. And so you ask me, do I trust the government? I don't trust the political government. I trust the people who go to work every day like we did as soldiers. Mm -hmm. We didn't politicize it. Uh, the, my shipmates or anything, I have no idea what their political philosophy was. All I know is I was in a foxhole with them. I don't care if they're, they have a different sexual orientation or what their politics. I want to know if they can shoot straight. I'm going to have to interrupt you because we are running out of time. But I will, I'm very serious about this. Can we have you guys back? Sure. Can we do part two? Mm -hmm. I don't think this is, this is far from being done. Yeah. Uh, before, I, before we go, I just want to mention yes. that uh, our job was to take care of each other over there. Yeah. Period. Uh, gathering intel, uh, and one of the most things that keep haunting me today is that we had two pilots north of Vietnam. They were down. We sent a Jolly Green Giant to pick them up. And I'm listening to communications, trying to find out where they're at, why, you know. And about that time, I hear their last words. Oh, my God, there's a missile. They were taken out with a MiG, shot a missile at them. And the, last, the, the most devastating sound I heard was the absolute silence mm -hmm. of what I heard next. They were gone. This is a good in, place to end this. Because those this guys, just like you said, they, they, were, they, were, they may be at a different service, but those are my brothers out there. Yeah. You're coming on the next show, and so are you. Yeah. And we're, I'm serious. I, w I want to finish this. Orders from the I'm, top, I'm, Howard. I'm, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, there, and there's, you know, I, and I, I, I consider myself fortunate because I didn't see some of the other aspects, but I heard a lot. But yeah. I heard it all. And you've not forgotten it. Absolutely. It's like it happened yesterday. Does it give you nightmares? I try not to have nightmares. So you have to work at not having nightmares. I, I get focused on something else. And that's how I get through. How do you do that? Concentrate, just like I got through college, got through uh, with, with, with my wife. Uh, she's the real backbone. And, uh, you married yeah, well then, Howard. Well, it, it was the first girl that asked me to go fishing, and I said, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah. I asked her to go camping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a big mistake. Yeah. Uh, I guess we're done. You I'm so sorry I kept you longer than we should have, but I'm very serious about having you come back for the next show because. This is far from being done, and I want mm -hmm. to talk more about your organization, which is really critical to a lot of people watching tonight. Thank you both. I'm not done with you. Believe me, I'm not done with you. <laughs> and we're going to have another part of this. Thanks for joining us tonight.